Hi, welcome to this lecture on mathematics in the control of robots. My name is Dr. James E. Pickering and I'm a lecturer at Aston University, which is located in Birmingham City Centre in the United Kingdom. My teaching and research interests are primarily in control engineering and autonomous systems, secondary in mechatronics and robotics. I'm a member of the following, so the I IEEE Technical Committee on Control Education, the Institute of Measurement Control, known as the INSTEM-C, and the Institution of Engineering Technology, known as the IET. My personal website, a link is given here, so www.james, and remember the e, pickering.com. Alternatively, you can scan the QR code here that will take you to the website. And on the website, you'll find um, some background information um, and also some of my teaching material and some, some further information. So in terms of the contents of today's lecture, I'm going to go over, initially introduce you to a robot for collision avoidance. So you can see here a sneak peek of this little robot here. I'll then talk about some of the key components that make up the robot. So the ultrasonic sensor for distance measurement, the DC motor for longitudinal motion, the, and then move on to then the control algorithm for collision avoidance. I'll then touch on model-based design before I show you the full robot working. Finally, I'll detail the conclusions of the talk. So what we're gonna cover here initially is the problem that I've introduced. So the robot for collision avoidance or cruise control. So you can see the aim. The aim is to design a control algorithm for collision avoidance or cruise control using a lab scaled vehicle. So you can see the lab scaled vehicle here. I'm not at this point going to go into any details in terms of the in terms of the bits and bobs on the car because we're going to talk about that as we move through. What we want the vehicle to do is maintain a 0.1 meter separation distance from the object ahead. So if this vehicle is traveling forward and then I don't know something comes out in front or it's following a vehicle ahead or or whatever really we want it to be able to maintain that 0.1 meter separation distance so I have this on a little illustration here where the vehicle here has longitudinal displacement along here they've got the object here and the vehicle stops within effectively 0.1 meters it's minus 0.1 meters because it's 0.1 meters behind the object and that become clear why I'm using a negative number there when we get more onto the control algorithm design. So we're gonna look at more detail here in terms of the robot. So there's three main components. So we've got the sensor, we've got the control algorithm, and we've got the actuators. You can see the sensor located here, here and here in this diagram, and the actuator, you can see there's effectively, if we're looking underneath the car here, there's these four DC motors here. And then the control algorithm here will be embedded onto this microcontroller. So the sensor effectively enables us to see. So in this case, in the robot, we want to be able to measure a distance to an object. So that's what we're gonna use. We use a distance measuring sensor. The control algorithm will then be receive that information and it'll effectively think of that information. It wants to achieve a certain task, i.e. keep 0.1 meters behind an object. So based on the measurements that it sees, the microcontroller will effectively do calculations. And then based on the, the, the information it's receiving and the control algorithm, it's gonna think and then take action. So for example, if we're getting close to the wall, it's gonna slow down the car. If, we're, if we are within 0.1 meters of the wall, what we want the car to do is stop at that point. Okay, so see, think, and take action, very important. In terms of human intelligence, we do something very much the same. So we use our effective our eyes or sensors to observe. So it could be that we're walking towards, uh, I don't know, a wall. So we are measuring, again, we are using our eyes, we're approximating distance to the wall. We are going to effectively we deduce and then we apply. So observe, deduce, apply. And the reason we're doing that is because we effectively want to achieve a certain task. So it could be, I don't know, we're walking towards a wall. We want to stop before we get to the wall. Okay, very simple task. I don't really quite know why you'd want to do it, but if you do, 
you know that as soon as you're approaching close to the wall, you need to start slowing down and then you need to stop to avoid walking into that wall. The robot will work in exactly the same way. So it's going to see, think, and then take action based on the information it gets from the sensor. So now I'm going to talk to you about the key points. So this is effectively what I want you to take away from this talk. So key point one, I want you to understand the key components of a control system. So the sensor here, the actuator, the control algorithm, and the system. Key point two, signals and data. So because we're using, you can see up here, a microcontroller, and effectively we're using a digital sensor, what we're going to use is effectively digital, is a digital control system. So as part of this is signals and data in the form that you can see here. So for measured distance, voltage, error, and then you can see here the time response. By the end of this talk, I want you to also be able to understand what these signals and this data means. And then the final point, so key point three, is the free term PID control. So this is in discrete time form because discrete time form is what we use for digital for a digital control system. So you can see this equation here, and at this point, you're probably going to get quite worried, thinking this is very difficult. But I promise you, it looks a lot more difficult in term it, than it is. It's a notation that's probably scaring you at once. I cover this. I'm sure by the end of this talk, you're going to understand this equation and how this relates to key point two and how this also relates to key point one. So what I'm going to detail now is the ultrasonic sensor for distance measurement. So the sensor we're going to use is this HCSRO4 ultrasonic sensor. The sensor is located at the front of the car, as you can see here, it looks like two eyes, and it's located within this bracket. You can see here a CAD diagram of the ultrasonic sensor that we're using. You'll notice it's got four pins down here. These are for effectively the voltage, the ground, and then it's got a trig and an echo pin. I'll talk more about those in a little while. What you can see here is this ultrasonic sensor from a top view. So we've got the receiver, we've got the transmitter, and then here we've got an object. So from the trig pin, what we do is we send, well, the, the sensor, this digital sensor, sends out a sound wave. So it sends out this sound wave, so it's this original wave. What it's going to do is bounce off this object and it's going to be reflected. And this is from, and then effectively the echo pin here is used to receive that data. Using that data, we can do a calculation for the distance measurement. So the distance is effectively denoted here D is equal to half multiplied by T, which is effectively T is the time between the trig and the echo. So the time that it takes effectively to do that. Multiplied by the speed of sound, which is approximately 343 meters a second. We've got a half here because if you think about it, the distance actually, in fact, is not. We don't want the distance to the object and back. We just want the distance to the object. So we use half here. So using this simple equation here, we can approximate what the distance measurement is using this ultrasonic sensor. Continuing the focus on the ultrasonic sensor for distance measurement. Imagine the lab scale down car traveling towards this object. It's now stopped at minus x meters away from the object. Previously, on the previous slide, we spoke about the waves being sent out from the ultrasonic sensor, bouncing off an object and then being received by ultrasonic sensor, and then a calculation being undertaken to effectively estimate the distance to the object. This all takes place within a given time period and we can effectively select how often we want that to occur so how often we want to measure the distance to the object so this is known as the sample time so for that given ultrasonic sensor what i want to do is effectively have a measurement of the distance every 0 0.01 seconds so my sample time is 0 0.01 seconds 
So every 0 0.01 seconds, I am going to receive or determine a measurement to the object. So we can see this here in a short little video I've got here. So you can see initially the distance between these is, is around minus 0 0.14. And you can see here it goes up to minus 0 0.08. So if I just play that video, what you'll see is, so here the distance you can see the calculations and with this the sample interval is 0 0.01 seconds so you can't really see the dis the differences between the temperature being measured because it's quite a obviously a very short sample time so it's collecting information at an incredibly quick rate what we notice though now is i've gone down it's about i don't know zero it's just on where well, you can see now actually i've i'm just changing the distance between the ultrasonic sensor and the this um, Rubik's cube I've got here, so the object that I'm using, and you'll notice obviously the distance is changing as a result on this graph, as you would expect. Okay, so it's working there quite effectively to capture the distance between the object and the ultrasonic sensor in a manner that I want it to do so in 0 0.01. Because that's, that's typically is a is a value that when we get onto the control algorithm is a value that I'm going to use for 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 the control algorithm and then finally when we get on to showing the robot working here you can see I've got the video from the previous slide so I've just got it there just so you can kind of visualize this again so the distance obviously between the object and the ultrasonic sensor changing and you can see it changing on the graph so the distance is getting smaller what we tend to do in control is we represent things using blocks. So you can see I've represented the ultrasonic sensor using a block and we represent signals using lines. And here with an arrow gives it direction. So this ultrasonic sensor and the signal coming out of here is effectively your sampled output, which we use the notation Y subscript K. So Y is just for your output, K denotes sampled. And effectively that sampled output is your measured distance in meters. So if we look at this on a graph, what I've got here along the X is effectively discrete time, and then K minus N. Where you can see here, K is effectively, well, you can see the current sample is K. K minus one is obviously when N is one, so that's my past sample, and K minus two, where N is obviously two, and that's two samples before. So K is my current sample, and then I've got two historic data samples. What I've got along the Y is my measured distance. So you can see here the values that I use there, and that's in meters. And then you can see current sample, so K, is effectively K, my measured, uh, my measured output, Y of K, which is effectively my current sample, is giving me a value of minus 0 0.230. And then if you look at historic captured, obviously sampled, so if we look at the past sample, so K minus one, you can see it's effectively the output for K minus one, which is the past sample, and that's giving me a value of 0 point, minus 0 0.234. And then finally, if you look at K minus two here, so it's, it's two samples before, and it's the output of the two samples before, so K minus two, is giving me a value of minus 0 0.236. Note this here, this is very, very important, this, this, this here, this is denoting here my sample time, which my sample time was 0 0.01. So the distance between these samples effectively in terms of discrete time is at 0 0.01. So I'm effectively capturing information, in, i.e. in terms of the measured distance, every 0 0.01 seconds and this is effectively what it looks like so if i was to zoom into effectively a part on here although the measurements here are much much larger but if i was to zoom into a small area like this you would effectively get sampled points that looked very much like this and the distance between the sample points would be 0 0.01 seconds What I'm now going to move on to is the DC motor actuator or actuators used for the longitudinal motion. So effectively what's going to create the motion so the car can travel forward. If you recall, we've got four 
DC motors located on for each one of these wheels and these are obviously mounted by via, via a bracket you'll see the DC motor here just spinning around and you see the shaft at the end of the motor here spinning this shaft spins based on giving it a effectively a voltage the voltage is for this motor is rated at 6 volts but what I'm going to provide it in a moment just to show as a demonstration is between 0 and 5 volts what uh, the sample time I'm going to use is 0 0.2 seconds I'm just initially using this for visual reasons so that you can see the voltage being effectively altered every 0 0.2 seconds based on um, effectively me changing the voltage so if I start the video now you'll see originally here it's 0 volts and I can go all the way up to 5 volts so you can see now initially I've supplied it with 1 volt so you can see here 1 volt now I'm just going to increase it you'll see it's going up to 2, 3, 5 volts so now we're all the way up to 5 volts so we're supplying it with 5 volts you'll see the 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 mode well in terms of the wheels they're spinning much 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 quicker from 5 volts instead of obviously zero where they're stationary and anywhere in between what it's going to do is obviously vary the voltage and it's going to vary the wheel speed so I told you initially the sample time was 0 0.2 seconds and what that effectively means it means the distance between the effect of me changing the voltage so if I'm altering the voltage over here it means that effectively in terms of in practice in terms of the DC motor I can only change the voltage every 0.2 seconds even if I'm altering the voltage you know like much much quicker because I'm altering it quite rapidly it will only update the voltage supply to DC motor every 0.2 seconds however in practice we will use 0.01 seconds because we need to be consistent in terms of what we use in the sample time for the DC motor and the sensor in terms of the ultrasonic sensor we need to make sure we're consistent so what I've got here is the graphical output from effectively the you can see the voltage varying between 0 and 5 and you can see like the staircase what um, again in terms of the ultrasonic sensor we represented components in these boxes so algorithm which is located on the digital microcontroller DC motor actuator system which is effectively located as a part of the system the whole coal car as a whole so the signal sent so the control oh, sorry not the control the algorithm output uk of star here is the algorithm output which effectively is a voltage so the voltage here output from the algorithm obviously depending on the algorithm so in the case of this the algorithm was really me just changing um, the value here and then that was then sending out a command which related to uk star which related to the voltage i.e the voltage change into the motor so we can represent this here in this uh, again this graphical form we've got discrete time along here so k minus n so current sample past sample and then two samples ago on the y-axis so now we have voltage and you can see the various voltage values there so uk of star which is your algorithm output the current sample is given by a value of 3.21 what this is done here is the voltage is effectively held for effectively the sample time selected so in this case I told you the sample time was 0 0.01 we're using so the voltage is held for 0 0.01 seconds and you can see the pass sample is held for 3.22 seconds for that t 0 0.01 seconds and then two samples ago the voltage was held for 3.2 um, 3.24 volts again for 0 0.01 seconds so you can see how this is operating it's effective in discrete time in each one of those sample points or sample times it's holding the voltage constant based on the the algorithm the, or what's being told by the algorithm so the algorithm is basically saying right algorithm output uk of star okay is effectively a given value and it relates to the voltage of 3.21 well so just summarizing up the previous slides so we had the ultrasonic sensor here represented by this block we had the sampled output was effectively the measured data given by this graph here the ultrasonic sensor is located on the system and we had the dc motor actuator and the system here i.e the car here and i put this there although there's not a signal there it's just to effectively represent that they're connected and here the algorithm here is effectively supplying a voltage and we can see the signals here 
So, so far, this is what we have. So we have just effectively an actuator and a sensor. So the actuator is causing longitudinal displacement and the ultrasonic sensor or the sensor is effectively measuring, measuring the distance to a given object. So we've got now the ability to effectively see and we've got the ability to take action. But now we've just got to move on to the control bit. So let's focus more now on the control algorithm for collision avoidance. So what you'll notice is now the sampled output from the ultrasonic sensor here has now been fed into this circle with the X. This is known as a summing junction and this enables us to add and subtract signals from one another. So in this summing junction, what you'll notice is you've got two signals going in. So you've got the sampled reference, which is your desired different distance, which is minus 0 0.1 meters. You then have your your measurement from your ultrasonic sensor and it's a negative here because what we do in control we use negative unity feedback or negative feedback um when well, practice negative feedback in in modeling negative unity feedback then what this forms is the sampled error so to determine the sampled error it's effectively here you can see e subscript k which is a sampled error is equal to the r of k which is your sampled reference take away my sampled output Okay, nice and simple. This block now, rather than just being called algorithm, it's now called my control algorithm. And in the next how many slides, I'm going to detail more into the control algorithm. So the whole idea behind this is effectively having a reference, a measurement, forming an error based on the difference between the two. So what we have here is some calculation of the sampled errors. So again, what I've taken in here is just the the part of the previous diagram just I've just included the measured distance, the sampled reference and the sampled error. So the calculation for the sampled error, so it's this one you saw previously. So it's just going to be equal to minus 0 0.10 because the reference is well, effectively the reference always is the same. It's minus 0 0.0 take away and then the measured value. OK, the measured value, and these are the values that we saw on the previous slide, is minus 0 0.230. And then, then this gives us an error, a sampled error, 0 0.130. And you can see that here. So in discrete time, my current sample here, E of K, 0 0.130. And then likewise, if I do the past sampled error, and then the sampled error from two samples ago, it just becomes RK minus 1 rk minus 2 yk minus 1 yk minus 2 and then obviously the the reference is always the same because it's just a constant value and then these numbers if you remember from the previous slides these measurements the distance here you can see changing and what you'll see here is obviously the errors changing because obviously the distance measured has also changed and you can see how these correspond here to the sampled error here for the past sample the two previous and then the sampled value given here. So this is the graph that we determined on the previous slide where you can see discrete time the errors changing based on obviously the measured value changing and obviously the reference here minus 0 0.1 being constant but the measured distance ch difference distance changes and hence the sampled error changes. That sampled error is used as part of the control algorithm. The control algorithm we're going to detail I'm going to detail in this talk is known as a PID or proportional integral and derivative um, control algorithm. So focusing on this error signal that we formed to so the difference between the reference and the measured value, there's three actions that we can do on this uh, signal. So we can effectively, for example, if we're just looking at the current sample error here, we can multiply that error signal. What we can do is if we take into account the current and the past sample, so this one, this one, what we can do is effectively integrate to determine the area of that. What we can also do is differentiate it so we can work out effectively an approximate for the rate of change of these errors. So we can look at the rate of change um, with the, uh, if we can differentiate the signal. So multiply, integrate, differentiate. That's what we can do with the free uh, initially with this error signal. These terms correspond to, so these three actions correspond to PID gains. 
So a multiply error signal corresponds to this proportional control gain. The integrate, if we integrate the error signal, which is the error here, we effectively multiply that by this integral control gain KP. And we, to differentiate the error signal, we also introduce this derivative control gain K subscript D. This is going to make more sense as we go through in the coming slide. So for now, just be aware there's three actions we can take on that error signal to effectively give us um, system performance in terms of the car stopping at the, the position that we want it to stop using potentially these three control methods. So the first um, control method we'll look at is just a proportional control. So proportional to P control. You'll notice in the block now I've just introduced a K P value, so proportional control gain. What I told you previously was effectively you can multiply by the sampled error, and that's all a proportional control gain does. So the control algorithm output here, UK of star, is now effectively just KP multiplied by E of K, which is your current sample multiplied by this proportional control gain, and that then will be your control algorithm output. This KP value here um, is, is specified by a given value, and that later when we get on to methods of tuning um, portional integral derivative controls, um, well, it's not going to be covered within this lecture, but there is a, a kind of a skill to effectively selecting a ideal value for the KP there. So on this slide, we can see the effect of the proportional control gain on the performance of the car. So in this, you can see here is a graph. Here you can see effectively time versus distance. You can see the reference here on the legend, minus um, 0 0.10, so you can see there the reference. You can also see an illustration here where you've got an object and then the reference, which is minus 0 0.10 meters behind. So what I'm going to do initially is to introduce here just a proportional control gain KP. So I haven't specified a value of KP, it could be 10. OK, we will just say 10 for now. And what you'll notice is, because it's orange here, this is the effect of the car now. It starts from this position and then it effectively rests at that position, which you can see here on the diagram. So you can see the car here and you can see there the reference and you can see it's minus 0 0.18 meters away. So minus 0 0.18 meters away, that's the graph there. What you'll notice is the difference between the reference and the proportional um, control gain um, system, well, the, the, the cart movement here. I've denoted the difference SSE, which is effectively steady state error, which is the difference between the reference and the final value of the system. And as I increase the proportional control gain, so if, say, for example, if I double the value, what you'll notice is the steady state error here has reduced. So now the value is minus 0 0.14, minus 0 0.14 here. So you can see the steady state error has reduced. Hence, the car now is getting closer to the reference with that particular control method. So it's using the sensor, actuator, and the portion of control gain to effectively achieve that value. Then if I increase it further, so 3 multiplied by the portion of control gain, what you now notice is it's effectively overshot, and it's gone to minus 0 0.08 metres, However, you still have this steady state error here. So the proportional control gain is useful for reducing the steady state error. It's also useful in increasing the response time, i.e. the time that it takes to effectively achieve the final value of the system, i.e. when there's no rate of change on the system response. So if we now move on to the integral control. So I told you the integral was effectively the area between two samples a current sample in this case, and a past sample. We can work out this using this equation here, which is effectively going to give us our area. So it's known as the trapezoidal rule for the integral. So the current sample, take away the past sample, divided by 2, is effectively just going to give me a midpoint between those two. Divide, uh, sorry, multiplied by Ts is then going to give me the area. So it gives me an approximation for the area underneath those two samples, i.e. it's the mean of the two vertical heights times the width equals the area. So that there is the initial determining the area. Now what we're doing for the integral control is we're determining the previous area. So we're taking the past sample and then the sample from 
two times ago and effectively we can determine the area of this because it's just going to be ek minus one take away ek minus two divided by two multiply by ts and that's going to give us the area here in green however we don't want to keep doing this because this is going to require lots and lots of calculations you imagine your sam we're, we're using a time step or sample time of 0.01 so imagine having to do these calculations or for a long period of time you end up with a long equation so what we actually do is at uh, each time step we compute the area of the most recent i.e this one and we effectively sum up all the previous um, calculated values so integrating as time progresses so all the previous values that have gone before this one we actually sum all those up and put them into just one one number and then we just determine this one here and that effectively the integral summing those up will hold the control action if the error for example becomes zero so what you can see now is effectively what we've just determined this here so the control action uk of star here so effectively which is controlling the voltage is equal to k subscript i which is your proportional control gain value and then multiplied by that what we've got in the block so effectively the proportional control gain multiplied by the area of the uh, recent um, integral and then all the other ones previously summed up so using previous int for the next step previous int is equal to previous int plus then obviously the current integral so again just through the proportional control gain this ki value would be specified a number and that's a number that you you, you you determine based on your tuning methods for the proportional integral derivative control so if we represent the key effects of the integral control gain um, graphically and also with an illustration what you'll see if i use the reference again which is just going to be minus 0 0.1 meters and then if we look at the proportional control gain here so we i put the worst case here where we had the largest steady state error and you can see this here so if we introduce a proportional and an integral what you'll notice on the graph now because it's this red line here don't get confused with my line you'll notice now that the effectively the robot matches the distance so the distance is increasing as it's traveling now ends up matching the reference so we have effectively zero steady state error and you can see this again the robot here and then you can see the value there that we've measured and again zero steady state error so the key effect of the integral control is it eliminates steady state error so now if we focus on the derivative control so again i told you this just to recap i told you this was the rate of change of the error error so the sampled error here so if we look at sampled errors so the current sample and the past sample what we can do using the backward Euler approximation for the derivative we can effectively determine the average slope between the two samples and this is given by this so e of k is the current sample take away e of k minus one so past sample divided by ts is going to give me this midpoint which is effectively an approximation of the derivative and then we've determined the derivative effectively here to determine this point here what we multiply this by is the derivative control gain. So what we end up then with our control algorithm output when we consider a derivative is simply just as I said, KD for um, derivative control gain multiplied by this equation, which, which approximates this midpoint for us. So that there is the derivative control. So it's effectively taking into account the rate of change of the error. So if we're looking again at the effect of the derivative control so likewise we've we've got the reference i've got the proportional control gain value that we saw earlier the worst case i've added the proportional and integral where we had zero steady state error i.e the the lab scale car meets the reference and uh, meets the aim if we introduce the full pid control so the proportional the integral and the derivative what it gives us basically is a system possibly that has zero state state error and gives us a faster response time and stiffer control so if there's any oscillations on the system response any kind of or if we want the system to to respond faster we can introduce a derivative 
However, just be aware you are limited by your, your actuator in terms of how quick the response time can actually, in fact, be in practice. So just to summarise up on the previous slides. So from the ultrasonic sensor, we get the sampled output. The sampled output is subtracted from the sampled reference to form the sampled error. So when there's a difference between what we're measuring and what we desire, i.e. minus 0.1 metres, there it forms a sampled error. The sampled error, in the case of the proportional control, multiplies by it to give an usual control output. And in terms of the integral, what we get is we determine the area of the first integral and then we sum up all the previous integrals. In terms of the derivative, we're working at the midpoint of two areas. Kp, Ki and Kd are all um, gain values that are specified based on uh, tuning, effectively tuning of the proportional integral derivative. Obviously, because these are these here are all dictated by numbers, these obviously change also with time. What happens with this? So the output is given here. These all sum together and then form the control algorithm output. So the whole equation you can see here is UK star is equal to KP multiplied EP, KI multiplying square brackets, the area of the first integral plus the previous integrals, plus KD multiplied by effectively the midpoint of the, of the current and the previous sample. So as I said, these numbers here need to be given values. These here are obviously, these have numbers. And just to kind of summarise, the free term PRD will give desired system formants. However, you don't always need to use the free terms, the proportional integral derivative. For some types of systems, a proportional is perfectly fine. Some types of systems you don't want to put an integrator on because it's going to cause problems, um, etc. So if we're looking at this equation here, the sample data system that we've just derived for the proportional integral derivative, I'm going to quickly show you how this would look in terms of code. So if I go here, you can see I've specified the reference. The so reference is equal to minus 0 0.1. The error is just the reference take away the measured distance. The integral error is just effectively the equation you know that we determined. So the difference between the errors divided by 2 multiplied by the elapsed time. So the elapsed time will just be the sample interval. Um, diff error, which is the error take away the last error, divided by the elapsed time, which again is a, is a sample time, 0 0.01. And then the output here you can see just becomes Kp multiplied by error plus Kp multiplied by integral error plus Kd multiplied by diff error. Okay, and what you'll notice is that I've specified values for Kp, Ki and Kd. So in terms of how these were determined, again, I keep saying there's, there's, there's various methods, trial and error, model-based, and I'll quickly, briefly talk about model-based on the next slide. So I'm only going to quickly talk to you about model-based design. This is one method to effectively tune your PID controller. And what I mean by tune is effectively select K, um, P, K, I and K, D values that are going to give me desired system performance, i.e. in terms of the aim, get the car to achieve the reference of minus 0 point, uh, 0 0.1 metres. So how we do this is we effectively capture a mathematical model of the open loop system, including the actuator. So it's of like the, the lab scaled car you can see here. We've got feedback here. And what we assume in modeling normally is we assume an ideal sensor, i.e. unity gains. There's no dynamics, no lags, um, no noise initially, you can see here. What we can do then is we can tune the PID controller, or in this case, I've just got a proportional controller here, in um, using this simulation package. So here I've got my negative um, feedback again. I've got my reference. This here is just used to effectively um, to to effectively here so I can effectively look at this output which is given here, which just maps the reference um, output to the actual system output. So as you can see here, so what this enables me to do a model based approach is I can effectively get a mathematical model of the system. I can put a reference, I can put the feedback on negative unity feedback, I can then effectively tune the controller in simulation and I can quickly look at graphical outputs. So you can see here the reference of minus 0 0.1 and you can see in blue the, um, the actual dynamics of the car. So you can see it achieving there the reference um, within, I don't know, within less than a second. 
Okay, so what I can quickly do in simulation is quickly make changes, i.e. tuning the PID with the results readily available. So it's a good tool for me to kind of quickly make changes to understand what's going on with the system um, and, and to come to kind of a, a product that works as, as, I, as I hope. So what I'm doing here is some initial testing of the control algorithm and the electronics. I'm just making sure the logic in the control works and also the electronics of the robot obviously working. For this initial, just a proportional control gain is, is used. So just a closely control system proportional control gain. You can see on this video here, we've got the reference here. And what you'll initially see is the measured distance value is around, I don't know, minus 0 0.17. The error is around 0 0.06. And the voltage being supplied is just over one volt. So what you'll notice is that I move the car towards the reference. Obviously, the wheels are going to reduce in terms of their, how much they're spinning. Um, and that's what you would expect. And obviously, you can see the corresponding graphs changing. So the error is going to get smaller as you get closer to the reference. The voltage is also going to get lower. And the measured distance is going to get closer to minus 0.1. I do apologize. The graphs to the right are a little bit laggy. And I perhaps didn't realize this when I was capturing this data that I maybe had too many applications open on my laptop. And um, yeah, as a result, it's causing this um, lag. So I do apologize, but I believe that the, the purpose of those is, is, is kind of there. And you'll get the idea of closer to the reference, lower the error. The measured distance will be close to 0 0.01. And the voltage is going to also going to be close to zero as we get, well, it's going to go towards zero as we get towards the reference. So what I have here is a control configuration using a proportional control gain. So when I was going through the proportional integral derivative control gains, I found that proportional control gain was sufficient to give me the desired system performance that I required, i.e. 0.1 meter separation distance from the object ahead. So if I quickly run this video, you can see this red line here is the reference. Um, it's not so clear on the video, I guess. Um, and what you'll notice is KP is equal to 400. We've got quite a lot of steady state error there. KP is equal to 600. The steady state error is reducing. Then if we got to KP is equal to 800, the steady state error has pretty much reduced there. We're pretty much bang on the reference there. KP with 1,000, we've gone over the reference. And you'll notice the LEDs have gone up, which, which we've, have gone over, which indicates to me that we've gone over the reference. So... Then if we go for 1,400, you can see we're significantly going over the reference and we've got steady state error. So KP equals to 800 meets the initial aim of the reference. You can see the LED there is blinking um, because it's you know, because we've pretty much met the reference. So you can see in this case, a proportional control gain was sufficient to meet the initial aim. If we were to make, for example, the, the object dynamic, so it could be that this car has to track an object, it would likely be then we'd need to introduce um, an integral or a derivative control gain. But I believe because the object is static, it's, it's, it's sufficient just to have a portional control gain on this particular, for this particular application. So for the KP is equal to 800, I've captured the data here. So we've got time here and distance in meters. So you can see here the reference is the orange, so it's minus 0.1. And in blue is the measured data. So what you'll see here is that effectively the measured data is pretty pretty bang on close to the reference, i.e. a value of minus 0 0.1. You've got here a little bit of overshoot, and I think that's just to, just to do with the effectively the scaled down um, lab car, effectively just hitting the target, the reference, and then just rocking back and forth a little bit. But overall, you can see that using the proportional control gain here, we've achieved our aim for this particular application. So now if you move on to the conclusions, the key components of a control system have been described, i.e. the sensor, so the ability to see, the actuator, so the ability to take action, the control algorithm, so the ability to effectively think. So these three combined, so if we can effectively see, we can think with the control algorithm, and then we can take action with the actuator. So we saw how we could effectively take the, in this case, the robe, um, the lab scale car, which is the system, we could effectively 
achieve a desired position for the for the robot using those three key components. The signals and data for a typical digital control system have been introduced. So the sample interval of sensor data, the effectively the staircase signal for the actuator, so the, the holding of the voltage for the sample interval, and the forming of the error signal, which is fundamental for a control system. So determine the difference between the reference and the measured value. And then finally, what we looked at in the end was the time solution. So effectively capturing data from the operation of the, well, from the sensor as the, as the robot actually works in real time. So the free term PID control uh, algorithm for a collision avoidance system has been demonstrated. In the end, we just, I just use proportional control to achieve the initial aim. However, integral and derivative are fundamental. If, for example, you had a system that had steady state error, you might want to introduce a integral and a derivative if you had like oscillation on the system response. And those three terms, if needed, will give you a very, very stiff and responsive control method. And throughout, we've used a practical example. So thank you for listening. If you want to know more in terms of model based design and control, um, please see my website www.jamesepickering.com. And if you want to reach out to me and contact me, my email address is available here. So control at jamesepickering.com. Thank you.